day before Thanksgiving in 1971, a man identifying himself as Dan Cooper bought a plane ticket from Portland to Seattle. He hijacked the plane, claiming he had a bomb in his briefcase and demanded $200,000 in four parachutes. He jumped out of the plane with the money and the bomb somewhere over the Pacific Northwest, never to be seen again. The FBI claims to have investigated over a thousand people, including dozens of deathbed confessions. In 2016, 45 years after the hijacking, the FBI suspended its investigation of the case. While the FBI is no longer looking for D.B. Cooper, there is a community of people who are trying to solve the case on their own. Welcome to the Cooper Vortex. In this episode, we're lucky to be joined by Joe Sweeney. If you're a fan of true crime, missing persons, mysterious events, and podcasts, you may recognize the voice you're about to hear. Joe was one of the hosts of Thinking Sideways, which was one of my personal favorite podcasts. He's got a new show out now, though, called The Shocking Details that he's doing with his friend Vincent Caldoni. It was really exciting for me to talk to one of my podcasting heroes, and he does not disappoint. As a broadcaster, Portlander, and mystery enthusiast, Joe has a lot to offer when it comes to D.B. Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, my good friend, Joe Sweeney. All right, then I figured what we would do is kind of start off how you got into true crime and podcasting, Mm -hmm. uh, and then jump into D.B. Cooper. All right. Well, the... um... The true crime thing, of course, you know, like many people, I've you know read true crime books off and on, starting with the Hardy Boys, which is all true, of course, when I was a kid, and uh, and, and of course I love mysteries as well. And Steve and Devin also are kind of into that stuff. And and Steve proposed this idea because Steve has been trying to to do something cool with the internet since forever, since you know before I knew the guy really. He was trying to and and. He was the first guy to, the first of the three of us to suggest that, you know, we should do a podcast of some sort, you know, that'd be fun. And uh, so. And how did the three of you get hooked up? uh, Well, I knew, um, I used to paddle on a dragon boat team here in Portland. And uh, Steve wound up uh, on my team. And Steve and this other guy, Rob, and Steve and Steve and Rob and I hung out a lot and drank together a lot and stuff like that. And. That was what that was first when the idea of doing a podcast kind of came up and we discussed it and everything because we would have these, you know, fun conversations and Steve was like, you know, God, we had to just get some microphones and record this stuff and put it on the internet. And, uh, and, uh, but that was like, uh, that kind of went back and forth. We almost did it, but Rob was a little bit uh, mercurial and, and, uh, kind of decided to back out of the project. And that's when we went out and recruited Devin. Because Devin was somebody that Steve and I knew from uh, hanging out at this at this bar, and uh, and by the way, Devin is not a bar fly, but she she does she did have friends who went to this bar, and she went there and hung out with her friends some, um, and so it was sort of a mutual friends kind of thing, and that's when we started chatting with her, and we thought, and Steve and I thought that Devin would actually be kind of a, a fun fit for our podcast idea. So we recruited her to be part of it too. And, uh, and she worked out really well. Devin's got a big fan following as, as you're probably aware. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's, un- it's unfortunate, you know, she needs to be doing a podcast again. I'm sure lots and lots of people would like to hear from Devin more. Not to mention- and what year was that you guys did your first episode? That was 2013. So way back when. <laughs> a long time ago so we did it for five years and uh then steve decided to to uh leave the country and go be an expat in southeast asia for a while and um and so i got i got to work you know pondering this whole new podcast thing and uh and so that's what i've kind of been working on doing a lot of research tracking down stories and things like that and um and so finally, we kicked off the new podcast just several weeks ago. Started dropping episodes, and uh, we got some follow. Or we got some listeners, so it's, that's nice. Um, we're not up to where I'd like to be. I was hoping we'd have like half a million downloads per episode in the first week, but that's not happening. But uh, I kind of suspect that doesn't happen to anybody. Half a million downloads in the first week, boy, that was a lofty goal, Joe. I know, I know. I like to set myself up for failure. 
And I'm very <laughs> good at it. Uh, well, I was talking to Justin at Generation Y just the other day, and he said there are 400,000 downloads an episode, which is pretty stellar, you ask me. I mean, oh, you know, for an, for an amateur kind of podcast, not it's not something that's put up by Joe Rogan or NPR or somebody like that, you know, and uh, that's 400,000 is, is really pretty amazing. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I mean, just the fact that you can put it out there and, and get an audience. I mean, when you guys were doing Thinking Sideways, were you surprised at, at how the show grew? Did you guys have any initial goals when you started it? Uh, not really. I mean, we, we were obviously, we wanted more and more, more people to listen, but we didn't have a set goal. Like we want X number of downloads per episode. And, uh, it was interesting too. the, the, uh, the, um, the things that, that got us listeners were actually kind of surprising to us. Like for example, we're putzing along at, uh, Oh, you know, I don't know what, a fairly low number of, of listeners, like, you know, 10, 15, 20,000, maybe something like that. And then um, the um, the thing the, the remember flight three seventy is MV three seventy or no excuse me MH three seventy the flight that disappeared over the Indian Ocean yeah yeah and so we had this five year rule thing going on where we wouldn't talk about any mystery that was less than five years old uh, just so we wouldn't be overtaken by the headlines you know and. Uh, um, but I, I had this idea that, you know, we should do an episode about this, even though it happened just like last week or whatever. So we did an episode about that and, uh, it, uh, it really, that really caused our downloads to jump big time. I mean, um, a lot of people were doing web searches for MH370 and just stumbled across the podcast. And so that got us a ton of listeners. So that was fortuitous. And then the next thing that gave us a big bump, I mean, and things were continuing gradually growing but this but we had a few bumps from things like this yeah the next thing was um after serial ended serial came out and that was the first really big time podcast you know and um after it ended mashable that online website they did a, a little article called you know seven podcasts to listen to after you after you're done with serial and they listed us as one of the one of these podcasts and that was huge that got us a lot of new listeners so it was just things, some of that stuff, some of the stuff that gave us some good growth actually was kind of random, really, uh, and, uh, you know, unintentional on our part, really. But it worked out, so hey, I'm happy. Do you have a favorite case that you guys covered doing that show? Oh, God, I don't know. There's, uh, there's, there's some of them. Uh, that I, there's some of them that I like for various and different reasons. Like one of, there's a couple of them that I still think about because um, I still think it's that I, I think that the evidence that was put out there uh, was kind of misinterpreted by a lot of people. Like I look at um, one of my favorites was Brandon Swanson. who disappeared in Minnesota 10 plus years ago. I don't know if you remember that episode, if you listen to the podcast or not. I don't remember that episode specifically. Yeah, so Brandon was uh, Brandon was a 19 year old kid who just finished uh, finished his first year of college, and he'd been out doing a little partying with the, with some of his friends. And uh, there's no indication that he was hammered or anything like that, but he had had reportedly like a shot of whiskey and a few beers. And then he has to drive home to his his hometown of Marshall, Minnesota, which were from where he was. He was in Canby, Minnesota. And that would have been a straight shot down Highway 68, about mm, 20 some miles. And um, his car was found the next day on a side road off of that highway in a ditch. So that night, what happened is, is he ran his car into the ditch and eventually, like, a, I don't know what, two, you know, one thirty in the morning, winds up calling his parents and tells his parents that he uh, he's in a ditch and he needs them to come get him. And he believed that he was um, he was just off of Highway 23, northeast of the town of Lind, Minnesota, which is actually like 20 miles from where he actually was. And so his parents drive out there looking for him, and they're and they're driving around, flashing their lights and everything. And he's sitting in his car, going like, "I can't see you." And uh, Eventually, he gets frustrated, leaves his car and starts walking, tells his parents that he's going to walk to this tavern in the town of Wind and meet them there in the parking lot. 
Well, needless to say, he didn't show. But he was on the phone for a while with his dad as, as he walked along. And he tells his dad that, okay, well, I'm going to cut across this creepy old abandoned farm just to save myself a little a little time here. And walks uh, walks on for a little bit longer, describes to his dad, said, well, okay, I'm crossing a fence line. Mm. Okay, I'm crossing another fence line. Here, a little water off to my left, dad. And then he suddenly goes, oh, shit. And the line goes dead. And that was the last anybody heard from Brandon Swanson. So, you know, as, as information has, has come to light over the years about that particular episode, I've sort of, my, the, the initial thoughts of everybody that is out there is that uh, Brandon fell into this river, the, um, it's, uh, the Yellow Medicine River which is right by where he was, where he, he disappeared. And tracking dogs actually followed this trail right to the edge of the river. Everybody believes that Brandon fell into the river, and that's why he said, oh, shit. And uh, then he wandered off, climbs out of the river, wanders up. And by the way, of course, they scoured the river very, very thoroughly for his body using uh, cadaver dogs and everything and found no sign whatsoever of any dead bodies in the river at all. And so. It, it, it appears to me he did not drown in the river. But uh, so the, the, the belief out there is that he was wet. It was a cold night. It was like in, uh, it was like in May in Minnesota. And uh, so the belief out there is that he got wet, continued on his way, but eventually succumbed to hypothermia and just wandered off somewhere and died of hypothermia. And his body just hasn't been found. Now, my interpretation of that case is a little different. I don't think he fell into the river at all, and I can and I can actually make a case for it. And I do believe there was some foul play involved. I think that Brandon was probably murdered. But not very many people agree with me. So that's a case that I still occasionally will, will check on to see if uh, any new evidence has turned up. Uh, and last time I checked on it was, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago, I guess, and there was nothing new out there. But that, but that one is like my favorite in the sense in that that's one of the ones that I still kind of obsess over a little bit because I still believe that somebody, somebody did Brandon in and uh, there's somebody out there knows what really happened. Um, and some, and maybe someday we'll find out what did happen. But for now, most people think that Brandon just died of hypothermia and his body's out there somewhere. So we'll see who's right, you know, um, so that was a favorite in one respect. Uh, there's some of the other ones that I liked. Like one of our earliest episodes, we talked about uh, uh, Lake Anjikuni, Anjikuni Lake in Canada. No, I don't remember. I don't remember that one either. Uh, I really liked that one uh, because that was a story that I first read about when I was like a teenager. I was reading a book by, do you remember Frank Edwards? He wrote a bunch of books. He wrote a book called Stranger Than Science and stuff like that. I, Stranger Than Science sounds very familiar. Yeah, so I think it was in Stranger Than Science where he, he, he had this story. And uh, so this guy, um, his name was Joe LaBelle. He was a trapper way up in like the Northwest Territory in Canada, like way the hell up there in no man's land and all that stuff. And he was um, he was traveling, he was on foot, and he, was, he went to this Indian village, and he, he was kind of a regular there. He would pass through occasionally and uh, and. The, the natives were always friendly and there was always a place where he could stop off, spend the night, get a, get a warm meal. So he comes walking. So he comes to this village and as he's walking, well, as he's approaching the village, he noticed that there's something seems kind of wrong. And that is typically, it was kind of like early evening. Um, it was getting dark and typically you would expect people to be maybe cooking their dinner. You expect a little smoke from the campfires and stuff. You might expect sounds of, kids playing or dogs barking and there was nothing. It was deadly silent. And uh, when he got to the village, the village was completely deserted. And as he looked in the various huts in the village, he saw signs that people had left in a hurry. There were, there were tables that had dinner set on the table, on the tables. And, and, but there were no people. He found uh, a couple of, a couple of valuable things like rifles and stuff that had been just left behind. And it looked like the people of this village had just vanished. So creepy story, right? Yeah. Very creepy story. You should go back and listen to the episode. Um, so yeah, the mystery is what happened to the population of this village. 
Uh, I don't know if you want, I, maybe you should go back and just listen to it. I don't want to spoil things for you and your listeners or anything. Um, or do you want me to just tell you the whole thing? Uh, what's, what's your preference? Maybe we'll have to go back and listen to it, especially yeah. uh, some people in the, in the audience who may want to do that. But yeah. I mean, it's, you guys always did such a good job with missing persons. Mm-hmm. You know, cases where I thought I would not be interested in it, I would listen to the episode. One in particular, I want to say his name was Ben McDonald, who was in the oh, he was diving in the cave in Florida. Cave. Sorry, Ben McDaniels. Ben McDaniels, yeah, not McDonald. Yeah. yeah, yeah, that was a that is a fascinating little case, actually. Um, yeah, so interesting. And I, I didn't hear about that anywhere else. And you guys were referencing a, a documentary that had been produced independently about it. I actually ended up ordering that movie and watching it. How'd you like it? I thought it was good. I mean, the, what I find so interesting about that is how thoroughly they th- searched that underwater cave. Yeah. But then how all these like ancillary players in the case have kind of shady backgrounds. Yeah, I know. Although personally, I I think a lot of suspicion has been directed towards the guys who work and own that dive shop right there. Mm-hmm. And I, I personally don't think that they're good suspects in that case. Um, because, I mean, I, I've that's, that's always been my rule. Of course, some people are what we call stupid criminals. But me personally, I have, I have a personal rule about uh, crime, even though I don't commit crime. But if I were a murderer, I wouldn't I wouldn't crap in my own nest. You know what I'm saying? Right. If I was going to murder. If I was going to. There was no no motive that I could see anyway for these guys to kill him. But uh, on top of that, on top of that, why you know why do you leave his truck in your parking lot? You know, don't you take the truck and go dump it somewhere else? Maybe drive it into a swamp. <laughs> you know, and then they. And then there's a, a, that tank of his that they found in the spring. Once again, these guys were divers. And, um, are they going to drop one of his spare air tanks in the spring there, like making it look like you know he had gone into the cave and, and somehow died in the cave? Are you going to really do that? Because that's just going to bring a whole lot of attention down on you and, and your little thing there. And I just can't see that any rational human being would ever do something like that. Uh, you know, I, I, I kind of suspect that if somebody did him in, which is a possibility that, um, that they might've actually done him in somewhere else, driven his truck to that spot, left it there, maybe even gone out into the spring, maybe just in a boat and dropped a tank in there. And, uh, just to make it look like he had gone into that cave and died in the cave when his, probably his body was somewhere else entirely. And I don't remember, you know, actually, I remember the, the the story very clearly, but I don't remember precisely what I said in the episode. I, I'm assuming because I don't think my thought process have changed that much in the past few years. I'm assuming I said more or less the same thing then. But, uh, you know, um, another interesting aside about that one is that we uh, we got a long, fairly lengthy email after we dropped that episode from Ben's dad. And uh, luckily, he was not hurt or offended by anything that we said. So that which was good. And and I'm not going to share all the details of what he had to say about it or anything or, or anything like that. But it's, um, it's that's always something to remember too. Is when you cover stuff like that, is there's always that possibility that some family member might actually hear the podcast. So you know you got to be a little bit careful about what you say. You don't want to sound too callous and obviously you don't want to make any outrageous or irresponsible accusations because it can upset people. That's a great point. Let's get into that a little bit. Covering yeah. missing persons cases, especially, uh, especially ones from like the last 30 years where family is going to be alive still. Oh, yeah. Did you oh, guys yeah. hear from family a lot when you were covering those? Uh, no, not that often. Uh, just a few times. Um, but uh but you know, it did happen. We we would hear from somebody who, uh, uh, you know, knew somebody. I would. I remember another one that we got was was fascinating. Is so oh God, what was the name of the? Um, oh Christ, what was? Do you remember the one? Uh, it was about the people who and they were in Florida and their baby disappeared, 
it was this young couple. They had two kids, and they had had this they had this newborn child as well. And she vanished from their house, and um, it was believed that initially at least it looked like somebody had actually just walked into their house and stolen the baby out of the out of the crib and but but suspicion fell on the parents it was thought that there was some foul play on the part of the parents um and uh and um and they really kind of did a few things that really would have made me very suspicious too had it been the police now, what was the name of that kid? Ah, damn it. I can't remember now. <laughs> anyway, the story, long story short, um, my, it was believed by many, many people that for some reason or other, they had murdered the baby and disposed of the body. And I think that my conclusion was, well, actually, I'll, I'll leave it for people to listen to this one. It's, it was, God, what was the kids? Anyway, um, my conclusion was a little bit different that I did not believe that mom and dad murdered the baby, uh, at least didn't kill the baby deliberately. And, uh, but anyway, uh, long story short, after we were talking about emails, we got an email from one of our listeners. It turns out that, uh, she, uh, she actually knew one of the other children of these two, of this couple. And they were, this is years, you know, some years have gone by. So this, this girl had, had known her as a young adult and uh, she knew her and also had met her brother. And uh, she said it was like, you know, amazing because she had, first of all, not heard the story before. Apparently these people don't go around telling people they know about this story. <laughs> surprise, surprise. But also she said that uh, the two of them actually were very normal, very well-adjusted people which was interesting. I was, uh, it's kind of interesting to get that kind of information from people kind of after the fact that, uh, um, that, and so, and that sort of kind of solidified my thinking on it, which is that probably whatever happened to that baby, it was not a deliberate act of murder. It was possibly an accident or my theory. One of my theories is that possibly, um, the baby was killed by one of her siblings which is basically really not at all. And it's actually far more common than you think. Um, kids, very young children, very young children uh, actually don't have a real concept of death. I, I forget it takes them. You know, kids don't actually really understand the whole meaning of death until like they're eight, 10 years old, something like that. So people, kids killing their, their baby siblings is not at all unheard of. And that was my Chief theory, of course, you know, it's like, no, no evidence, of course, but that, that perhaps this baby was killed by one of her, by her older brother or sister. And the parents obviously wanted to keep that quiet because they didn't want their child, their other child to go through life with this stigma hanging over them. And so they just decided to, you know, disappear the baby's body and try to paper over the whole thing. So that's a possibility. Um but and but anyway, I'm getting way off base here. But that was an, another email that we got from somebody. Um, we got a message from somebody followed. Do you remember the episode about the White House murders? Jeremy Bamber was accused of killing his family in England. Yes. Yeah. In fact, I follow I follow Jeremy Bamber on Twitter. I'm getting updates all the time. And it's actually not his Twitter account, but is he's got many supporters in England who think that he got kind of a raw deal. And um, why not? One of the, the one of the points of contention in the trial was that Jeremy Bamber got a call from his dad saying that his sister was, had gone kind of crazy and was half over the edge and was running around with a loaded rifle in their house because his Jeremy's sister was living at home with her two kids um, at that time. And so dad calls him instead of calling nine one one, and. Um, and so Jeremy sort of moseyed over there to see what was going on. The police, in the meantime, also got a call. So they moseyed over there. And, uh, and long story short, uh, eventually they, it was after looking and, and doing kind of a, frankly, a botched investigation, they concluded that Jeremy Bamber had actually murdered the family, even though initially they thought the sister had just gone berserk. She'd had mental issues. And, uh, and, um, one of the points of contention in the trial is like, well, Jeremy said he got a call from his dad and that's why he was driving over to the house. But who, you know, when something like that is going on, who calls a family member rather than just calling 911, right? 
so we got a message later on from one of our listeners who actually used to be a 911 operator. And she said that it actually happens all the time. People, you know, something is happening and people just immediately speed dial one of their friends or, or more likely family and they don't call 911 first. So that's just one of those little tidbits is like uh, one of those little things that I had not known that that actually and it's great when people who actually have a little bit of knowledge of this that whatever send us a, a message and you know help us out with some of their more specialized knowledge of this kind of thing and uh, that's I, I really that's another thing is i just loved uh, our listeners because a lot of them did have information or you know they just called up or sent us an email just, just to say hi and we love i love this story yada yada it was great to hear from those guys that's why I'm getting back into podcasting, by the way. I miss the fans. I'm, I liked I liked our fans. Well, there was one story on Thinking Sideways that you were asked to cover several times, including by me, mm-hmm. but you never covered it. And that's a D.B. Cooper. Why yeah. did you guys never cover that? You know, we just never quite got around to it. I think that sooner or later we would have. Um, and I, I, I do want to talk about it in my new podcast a bit. I did. You know, I was, uh, of course, when we started the podcast, I was well aware of Cooper because I'm born in Portland, Oregon. So how can you not be aware of D.B. Cooper? Right. And uh, it's it's, a, it's still a much more alive mystery up here than in other parts of the country, I think. Oh, yeah. And um, but I'd never really done a deep dive. And then after we started doing the podcast, I decided, well, you know, I'm a mystery podcaster. So I guess I better I better look into the big kahuna. Because frankly, as far as mysteries go, D.B. Cooper is kind of the big kahuna, don't you think? It's it's a big one. I definitely think so. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I did start doing a lot of research into it and uh, found some great resources on the interwebs. Um, read a few books. Jeffrey Graves, Gray's book, by the way, is a pretty good introduction to the whole thing. Uh, I assume you've read that one, right? It is. Skyjack. Yeah. Uh, it's very entertaining. It's very well written. Yeah. And it is a good primer for the D.B. Cooper yeah, case. Yeah, it is. And then, um, and then of course, Bruce, uh, Bruce Smith's book is a good reference work, I think. Um, I don't Do you have that one, D.B. Cooper and the FBI? But, of course. Yeah, okay. I always tell people the books to start with on D.B. Cooper are Skyjack by Jeffrey Gray, D.B. Cooper and the FBI by Bruce Smith. Yeah. And then Finding D.B. Cooper by Marty Andrade. You know, that is one which is that mostly read. about surviving the jump. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, surviving. That's that's an interesting point. I've, I've actually done some thinking about that particular one. I'm not convinced that D.B. Cooper actually jumped where everybody thinks that he did. So, um, and uh, I think there is, a, if you look at the record, there is some, there's a bit of support for the possibility that he jumped somewhere else, like further south. I certainly. Yeah. Where do you think he jumped, Joe? Well, had I been Cooper, and you know, even even Larry Carr, who you're familiar with of the FBI, said it made absolutely no sense for Cooper to jump where he did over Southwest Washington. Of course, prevailing winds would have carried him into a fairly. Nah, we're not talking Rocky Mountains here, but it would have been kind of rough forested terrain. Uh, he would have been far, far better off to stay on board the plane and jump out south over the Willamette Valley. It's not only is it nice and flat, um, but also the weather would have been better because, from, as, we, as you know, the weather was pretty foul that night when he jumped. And uh, definitely. And the wind, this cold, this whole cold front, storm front was moving in from the north. So the further south he went, the better the weather would be. Be a little bit warmer, a little less rainy, you know? And so. It made total sense for him to stay on that plane and jump out somewhere, I don't know where, south of Salem maybe, or I don't know if you're familiar with uh, the Oregon uh, geography or anything. Yeah, I grew up in Woodland. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, but for your listeners who are not, they were following a, a flight path that essentially paralleled, paralleled Interstate 5, and uh, so they went south, uh, past where he jumped, supposedly, and then past Portland, continued south. And from south of Portland, we that's the Willamette Valley. It's a kind of a very wide, flat valley, as you know. 
a lot of farmland in there. And it continues all kind of wide and flat like that all the way south past Eugene. And then it's sort of, I, and then the, that's kind of where the valley kind of ends and it gets rougher and more mountainous again. So really anywhere south of Portland and, you know, around Eugene to any, anyone, anywhere along there would have been a far better place to jump. So that's a pretty big potential landing zone, obviously. I'm not suggesting that we all go out there and start digging or anything like that. But uh, there, there's reason to believe that. Uh, I think it made more sense to jump out further south. Uh, Cooper did, if, uh, if you read the uh, radio transcripts and all the other documentation, Cooper put on his parachute right in front of Tina Mucklow. Um, and, and then... When all when all is said and done, he tells her to leave, uh, essentially leave, go up to the cockpit, close the door, and not come out for any reason, absolutely no reason for the rest of the flight. And so they basically they 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 did that. They stayed in the cockpit until all the way to Reno. But the question of uh, the question, of course, is why would he do that? Well. My prevailing theory about that is that he didn't want Tina to know precisely where and when he jumped. Does that make sense? It definitely makes sense. Yeah. Do you think that the pressure bump that everyone is talking about, that the pilots noticed, and they've sort of tested that and believed that that was when he jumped off the back stairs? Yeah. Do you think it's possible that Cooper staged that? Um, yeah, you know, Larry, Larry Carr said, has said that, uh, it would be, it would have been impossible for him to do that. Um, but, uh, you know, of course, you know, it wasn't impossible. I mean, obviously the FBI did it just a few days later by pushing a couple of sleds out the back of the same plane and they replicated the pressure bump. So, okay. And of course, uh, Cooper didn't have like 200 pounds of sandbags with him, so, he couldn't replicate the pressure bump the same way the FBI did. But that doesn't mean he wasn't able to do it. And one of the things that I consider, again, just, you know, again, this is all purely speculative on my part, right? So, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying that I'm 100% convinced that this is what happened. But if I were Cooper, and if I happen to know a lot about the 727, and if I wanted to create a pressure bump that would be noticed up in the cockpit. Here's how I would do it. Um, have you looked at, have you taken a look at the 727? Yes, I have. Have you, have you actually seen one in person and, and inspected the air stairs? No, I have not. I know there's that one outside is, I think it's outside Beaverton. Yeah. It's out in Hillsboro. Um, it's, it's owned by a guy named Bruce Campbell. He was, by the way, he's a, he's a real, real nice guy, very friendly. And he's, he is happy uh, to have people come by and check out his plane and stuff. And so I went and paid him a visit a couple of years ago, and looked at the air stairs. There is uh, the, the stairs work this way. They fold down out of the back of the plane. Um, they're hinged, um, as you're aware. There's a, there's a two-part mechanism. There's a U-shaped uh, thing at the top that has two arms that, that hang down. And then there's two arms that hinge with those or attach to the ends of those and that actually connect to the air stairs. So when you go to release the air stairs to lower them. Oh, and hey, by the way, a little aside, have you been watching Narcos Mexico? No, I haven't. Yeah, season two, they actually uh, they actually have a little 727 action. Oh, really? So if I were Cooper and I wanted to fake uh, a pressure bump, what I would do is I would lower the air stairs in flight and... What, what you do in, in standard operation you, you, when you're using these things, you're, the flight attendant is supposed to lock them in place. There's a locking mechanism on either side of the passageway. And those, those upper arms swing down and uh, the, the flight attendant is supposed to go down and turn around, face the plane, grab the arms and, and jerk them towards the rear of the plane. And that pops them into these things, these receptacles that lock onto them. And that locks the stairs in place. And uh, and actually, uh, Bruce Campbell told me that flight crew, or excuse me, ground crews actually used to like to do this as a safety measure. They would lock the stairs in place. And that way, if somebody screwed up and overloaded the plane towards the rear of the plane, this has happened, by the way. People have overloaded planes, and the entire plane just sort of tips back and the nose way up in the air. It's, and so 
locking the stairs in place prevents that from happening. So it's, it's a good solid lock. So if Cooper wanted to, he could have, he could have dropped the stairs, gone down, locked the stairs, gone back up to where the, the lever is that operates the stairs and, and hit the lever to pull the lever to raise the stairs. And of course the airstream, the jet stream would have, have caused the stairs to pop upwards, creating a pressure bump. Now, did he actually do that? There's only one bit of evidence that I can find that remotely supports this idea, which is that if, um, if you read the transcripts, the radio transcripts, um, he started lowering the air stairs when the plane was still climbing. He didn't wait until they had gotten to 10. He, of course, he told them to go to 10,000 feet, but they were still climbing when he started dropping those stairs. And I talked to somebody who was a former pilot and I asked him that general question, which I was pretty sure I had the answer to anyway, which is, well, would, would a 727 or any other passenger jet, would it on, on its asset, or excuse me, its ascent, would it be going slower than it would be and when it reaches its cruising altitude? And he said, yeah, of course. And so, it's, and so that would be one good reason, unless, of course, Cooper was just in a real hurry to get off the plane, which is always, of course, possible. But let's say he, he you know, wasn't in that big of a hurry, then what? A, that, that's a good reason to start lowering those stairs while the plane is climbing, because that means there's less resistance for him when he goes down those stairs and tries to lock them into place. So that, hmm. that is one way that Cooper could possibly conceivably have created the pressure bump without actually jumping off the plane. That's really interesting. I hadn't thought of that before. Yeah. Well, again, speculation on my part. We don't really know. And I, I, all this stuff would assume would be assuming that Cooper knew a lot about the 727. And of course, we don't know that. We we won't know until we track the guy down and uh, you know and capture him. You know, if that if that's even possible. I mean, I'm I'm assuming he's more likely than not. He's dead by now, of course, but maybe not. Well, don't you think he did know a lot about the 727? Well, it certainly appears that he did. Um, he did, uh, and I. You know, I'm not even the pilots seem to think, wow, this guy seems to know what he's talking about. And so uh, it doesn't have to I mean, the pilots had to check with air traffic control if the plane could even fly with the stairs down. Mm -hmm. Air traffic control didn't know. So they had to call Boeing. Yeah. And um, and yeah, and it could. It's like, uh, and, oh, this, this, by the way, this is one reason I immediately ruled out Walter Recca as a suspect. Did you hear any of the tapes that uh, of Walter Recca talking? Oh, yeah. I watched the documentary. I've read both books on Walter Recca and I've interviewed uh, Vern Jones and Joe Koenig. Oh, uh, okay. Did you, uh, what's your, what's your opinion on Walter as a suspect? Walter as a suspect, I'm not sure. It is kind of hard to justify where he landed. Yeah. And, but he does have, there is a witness for that. Mm -hmm. I find Walt's story interesting because it's so far outside of some of the other theories that that kind of automatically for me gives it some credit that the story is so different. Yeah, You know, everyone else is like this genius who knows everything about the plane and has planned everything out. And Walt kind of just draws the plan on a napkin and gets lucky the whole way. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, uh, you know, it makes him a fun suspect. I, I, the problem that I had with Walt as a suspect though, is that Walt really didn't seem to know anything whatsoever about the 727. Uh, he said, that one of the, I didn't listen to all of his tapes, but one of the ones that I heard, he said like, you know, you know, I didn't even know about the air stairs. You know, I was like, you know, and, until one of the stewardesses pointed towards him and says, yeah, you know, there's stairs in the back. You can just jump off those, huh? And, and he goes, oh, really? I didn't know that. Okay. <laughs> and so, I mean, I'm, I'm kind of going like, seriously, I think, I think Cooper, I mean, obviously it's pretty well documented that he inquired when he bought his ticket that he made sure that he was flying on a 727. Yeah. Yeah. And also yeah. the Walt's persona and D.B. Cooper's persona Much are, are a little bit different. They are. They are. I don't know. And one of the things I noticed is that Walt seems to have, uh, seems to have had a verbal tick. He used, like a lot of us, to, they, we, we go, uh, a lot. And I'm sure I've, well, I do it without even realizing it. That's one of the things I discovered when I started doing a podcast is how much I say, uh, you know, I'm, 
a lot of us had these little verbal tics and uh, his big verbal tick was he kept, he, he would say right there a lot. Yes. You know, so that, that was not noted by anybody who interacted with him. He spent a lot of time with Tina Mucklow and you would think she would have said something about that. So that's another strike against Walter, in my opinion. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm not a fan of the Walter Recca story, even though I'm sure he was a fun guy, you know, and, and all that. And I, you know, I actually, even though I, I never took Walter Recca seriously as a suspect, you know, I always appreciate anybody that wants to go out there and come up with a fun new theory and a new suspect. You know, hey, you know, it's uh, that keeps the entertainment alive for the rest of us, right? Definitely. Yeah. And and does it hurt the case? Does Walter hurt the case? Or does a, a new suspect and a new theory, does that hurt the case? I, I don't think so. Not really. I mean, <laughs> I mean um, and uh, no, it's uh, it, you know, maybe, maybe if anything, it kind of helps it a little bit by, by keeping interest alive in it. Although it could reach a certain point where the public might be, you know, it's like, oh, you know, it's it's Tuesday. There's another D.B. Cooper suspect in the headlines, blah, blah, blah. You know, people are going to start to tuning the whole thing out. So you don't want to be throwing too many new suspects at the Cooper thing, um, obviously. But, you know, the occasional suspect, it's not a bad thing. I'm, uh, so, I, so far, I feel kind of bad. I've not been able to come up with any good suspects myself. You don't have a favorite suspect? Uh, no, um, I really don't. I know that a lot of people... Um, a lot of people do have their faves, and of course, I think that the leading one is, uh, what's his name? Oh my God, I'm having Saturday morning, and I've only had three cups of coffee, excuse me. Um, McCoy, Richard McCoy, is, seems to be the favorite of a lot of people. And uh, See, and I, I disagree with that. I mean, McCoy was young, yeah. and McCoy had these really prominent ears. That stuck out. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot about McCoy. His uh, his hairline's different. The the, the uh, I, as as far as I know, since he was a suspect, pretty contemporaneously, really, uh, is he photos of him were shown to Flo and Tina both, and both of them said he was not DB. Now, of course, you know, we always have to consider also the possibility of conspiracy. Maybe the flight crew was in on it, even though I don't I don't actually believe this to be the case. But, you know, we could consider that possibility that um, um, there was a conspiracy. The flight crew was in on it. And when Flo and Tina sat down with the police artist and gave their description of DB that we've all seen, of course, the drawings of DB, uh, it might be that they totally misled everybody. And that actually the real D.B. Cooper looked not at all like the one that the one that we've seen in our sketches. I mean, again, I don't believe that to be the case, but it is remotely possible. That's one of the theories that people who aren't real familiar with the case mm-hmm. tell me yeah. as if they've solved it. Yeah. Like, oh, I, I know all about the D.B. Cooper thing. It was the flight crew. Yeah. Uh, there was no D.B. Cooper, and that's why there's no picture of him, mm-hmm. because he wasn't even on that plane. He never existed, yeah. and the crew just split the money. Yeah, uh, you know, that's that's a fun theory, you know, and they actually, it's conceivable, although there were other passengers who did see Cooper, you know, and it's actually documented as well that, you know, obviously they, you know, they had a passenger manifest, and they, so they knew that Cooper got on the plane. And they knew he didn't get off the plane. Um, although, you know, it's, it's conceivable, of course, the crew lied about that to me to false entry in the manifest. But I still, I mean, that would have required a conspiracy, actually, that went a little bit beyond the people just on board the plane. Oh, yeah. And yeah, all agent, those yeah. people kept working for the airline. If I'm going to rob my employer, I want to get enough money that I don't have to go to work a week later. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, I mean... Um, of course, a lot of there's there's people out there that actually would like a little extra money, you know, for security or whatever to buy some nice stuff, but they still don't want to leave their jobs necessarily. So, and when he split that thing, the flight crew was like what uh, quite a few people two two hundred thousand bucks among the number of people that were on board that flight. That flight, of course, uh, when you consider that some of the several of the stewardesses were allowed to get off the plane in Seattle. It's quite conceivable they were not part of the conspiracy. And that's why they were allowed off the plane, right? So that takes it down to 
uh, what we got three guys in the cockpit plus Tino. Yep. Yeah. Okay. So that's 50 grand a piece. That's, that's a decent little chunk of change, but it's still not something that I probably would, I would quit my job over or retire. You know, it's like even in 1971, that's still what the equivalent of maybe 250, 300,000 bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So not, not a vast amount of money really, but, uh, but no, I, um, I, you know, I'm still intrigued by the possibility that perhaps Cooper had an accomplice in the crew, one accomplice, perhaps, but even that I, I, I wouldn't consider, and I don't think it was one of the stewardesses, uh, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a possibility. Why don't you think it was one of the stewardesses? Usually when I hear that one of the flight crew is in on it, it's Tina Mucklow. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably one of the reasons that poor old Tina has kind of gone underground. As far as I know, she's still alive. I have not heard anything about her dying. Have you? No, yeah. I, as far as I know, she's still alive, but does not want to speak about the case. Yeah, surprise, surprise. I don't blame her. I probably would be sick of it, too, if I were her. So, yeah, more power to you, Tina. Of course, that doesn't mean that when I show up, you shouldn't talk to me. But, you know. You can <laughs> yes, totally, exactly. You know, you can totally blow off all these other gay who's, you know, other than Darren and me. You know, don't talk to these people. But uh, um, uh, no, I think it's uh, one of the things that's that has intrigued me is that, you know, and again, this is really speculation on my part. So don't take this as any sort of accusation towards anybody. For one thing, it would be it would again make sense to have an accomplice in the crew, because if you're D.B. Cooper and you show up to hijack the plane and the crew just says, you know what, screw you, pal, then you're kind of stuck. You're in a hard place. And it strikes me that. Cooper probably did science out his, his little adventure pretty carefully. I think Cooper really, really, really didn't want to go to prison. And uh, I, I think that if you uh, if you look at some of the other things, like the amount of money he asked for, 200000 bucks, not a, not a huge amount of money. You know, he could have asked for more, but he didn't. And I think, I suspect that Cooper really wanted his little caper to go as smoothly as possible. So asking for, say, half a million bucks, well, that could be... That could be a speed bump in the whole thing. It takes longer for the authorities to gather five hundred thousand bucks versus two hundred thousand bucks. So that's you know that the, the, the demand for two hundred thousand bucks kind of indicates to me that Cooper placed a high priority on his mission going as smoothly and quickly as possible. And so, if you're that careful about the whole thing, having an accomplice in the cockpit makes a lot of sense. I know that when the plane was in uh, on the ground in Seattle, there was a little debate that popped up among the, the, the guys in the cockpit. I mean, there was, Cooper was clear in the back of the plane and there was an open door and some stairs right there. And they actually considered the possibility of just leaving the plane and saying, Hey, you know, what are you going to do Cooper? And, uh, one of the, and I'm not sure who it was. One of them decided that one of them basically made the point that no, we're, we would be abandoning Tino to this guy. And so we can't do that. So if you were to look at it from the tinfoil hat conspiratorial sort of, uh, point of view, perhaps that guy who said, no, we can't abandon Tino. Maybe he was Cooper's accomplice. You know, he saw this, this, and then, and he was precisely there to, and try to make sure that nothing like that happened. And so, but again, all speculation. So please, you know, don't, uh, don't, don't think that I'm accusing anybody at all of being a part of this thing, but I've considered the possibility that he had somebody up in the cockpit helping out. Well, how about this on the inside job angle? The airline had $250,000 in cash on hand in the event that they were hijacked. Now, that's not what I've heard. What I've heard, and I believe that they got it from a bank. I, that's what I heard is they got it from a bank. I think it was Seattle First Bank. Is that the one I'm thinking of? Yes. Yeah. And Seattle First had just had happened to have a pile of cash laying around for eventualities like that. But, of course, maybe, maybe they were keeping it there for the airlines. I mean, maybe the airlines just sort of got together and said, Hey, would we appreciate it if you just keep a several hundred thousand bucks just on hand, ready to go just in case of a hijacking and a ransom demand. So maybe it was at the behest of the airlines. I don't know. But my understanding is that Seattle first had the money sitting around earmarked for this sort of occasion. And of course they had already photographed all the bills. They had all the serial numbers and everything. It was all ready to go. So it was just a matter of, 
somebody going down there and scooping up the cash and leaving with it. Right. They had 250000 set aside, mm-hmm. and Cooper asks for 200000 Yeah. So, uh, of course, you know, it could be that even if he had, if it was an inside job, Cooper could very well have not known that they had this cash sitting around. I mean, I don't know. Or it could be that yeah, he was perfectly well aware that the cash was sitting around waiting to go. And maybe he thought that, well, if I demand 250000 bucks. Uh, that'll make people suspicious that there was an inside job. So, you know, that's another way. It's too on the nose. Yeah, just a little bit too much. But on the other hand, you know, his his demand for 200000 bucks versus, say, a quarter million bucks, I've always kind of wondered why he didn't round up to a quarter million bucks. A quarter million just seems just kind of seems like a nicer, rounder number to me. Yeah, I've always wondered that why that amount also. Yeah. And then, you know, when McCoy does his copycat, he asks for five hundred grand, yeah, and he gets it. And again, this is and, yeah. and again another reason I don't like McCoy as a suspect is um, he gets this money, and of course, when they finally find him, not to, not so much longer after that, they find most of the money in his house, and they found not a dollar of the Cooper ransom money in his house. And of course, the prevailing theory there is like, oh well, Cooper lost the money. That's why you know McCoy was Cooper, and McCoy lost the money the first time around. And so that's why he had to do it again. I I really question how exactly do you lose the money? I mean, Cooper, I, I think, had secured the money pretty well. Um, it's conceivable, I guess, that he drops the bag in mid-flight and uh, it's just never found. Or, or maybe the bag just sort of pops open and, and bills go flying everywhere and it's all just lost. But, of course, no bills ever turned up just randomly scattered around this, the countryside in the Northwest. So I think we can say pretty safely that that did not happen. You don't think he lost, uh, you don't think Cooper lost any of the money jumping out of the plane? I kind of doubt it. There's no, there's just no reason to believe that he did unless he was, uh, you know, he has, as, as I'm sure you know, he, he gets a bag. So he uses a piece of parachute cord to tie the bag shut and then, and then wraps the remaining cord around the bag to further secure the bag, and then uses another piece of parachute cord, apparently, to tie the bag to his body. That sounds right. Yeah, it's conceivable, of course, that uh, you know he was uh, incompetent at tying knots, and his knots came undone, and the whole bag just fell off him while he's while he's parachuting to the ground, and he never got it back. That's conceivable. It's just it seems unlikely. Um, Cooper was born. Given his age estimate and everything like that, uh, Cooper was born sometime in around the 1920s. And people of that age group knew how to tie a freaking knot, you know? I mean, right? I mean, it's not that hard, <laughs> yeah. you know? And, um, and I'm a, a, a lot younger than him, and but I know how to tie a decent knot that won't come undone. It's not rocket science. And Cooper does not strike me as a dumb guy. And I'm sorry, but, you know, it doesn't take that much intelligence to tie a decent knot. And of course, parachute cord is very strong. I mean, it's, it's not going to break. So the only th- possibility really here is that he tied a, he incompetently tied a knot and he lost the money. But yeah, I just, I, I don't find it credible that he lost the money. I've seen no evidence to me that indicates that he lost the money. How do you think the money ended up on Tina Barr? Uh, I think somebody put it there. I know there's still a lot of, um, a lot of contention about that. That's one of the things that I spent a little time looking into was uh, was how the money was configured. Like where there there were three packets of bills, two thousand bucks each. So were they scattered up and down the beach, or were they sort of in proximity to each other? Were they all sort of you know straight side by side, or were they stacked upon one another? And the best evidence that I've got, even though I've heard several different stories, this is one of the frustrating things, as I'm sure you know, is that. Um, so many different little aspects of this mystery. There's different versions out there. So the money, the money, you'll find different versions of how the money was was buried in the sand. Some people, I've even heard people say it was just laying right there on top of the sand. And uh, heard it's, and but the most authoritative source I found so far is Bruce Smith, who talked to Brian Ingram, who found the money, who said that basically the bill, the bills were stacked upon one another. So the, the they were essentially, you know packet and then slightly skew from that another one on top and then slightly skew from that another one on top so i don't see any possibility that they so they could have somehow floated there just through natural processes 
and just wound up stacked on, on top of one another, buried a couple of inches down in the sand. I don't see how that possibly could have happened. So somebody had to put the money there. And of course, I'm betting on Cooper doing it, although it could have been someone who knew Cooper, but I'm thinking most likely it was Cooper, which is great because that tells us a couple of important things. What does it tell us? Well, it tells us two things. I mean, oh, and by the way, there's another reason to believe the money was put there. Um, and Gray talks about that in Skyjack a little bit. Uh, Tom K examined the money and everything. And what he, they, they, they did some experiments with bundling bills together and just immersing them in water to see what would happen. And what they discovered is that the bills, once, once they fully soak up the water, they sort of fan out, even though they're still held together by a rubber band. They kind of fan out. And then when you, if you, when you pull them out of the water and let them dry again, the bills, of course, come back together because of gravity. But the, um, the ink in the serial numbers, well, slight amounts of it will transfer to the other bills. And so if the bills fan out and they come back together again, they don't come back together again perfectly square. So what they found is that the ink from one set of serial numbers will slightly stain the bill above it and slide just very, very slightly off from the serial number on that bill above it. So there's evidence that it's, so you can sort of tell if a packet has been immersed for a long period of time in water because you'll see that evidence of that staining of, of, of these bills being slightly off kilter like that. And when they looked at the bills that they found in the beach, they found that that evidence was not present. In other words, it did not appear that those bills had ever been immersed in water. Does that make sense, by the way? Did I explain that well? Yes, that does make sense. Yeah. So that's yet another reason to believe that they didn't float there through the water. They were put there by somebody. And, um, but, but as to what it tells us, it tells us, I think, two important things. And again, this is just me, so you don't have to take this as gospel. But I think it tells us, number one, that Cooper did survive the jump. And number two, I think it tells us that Cooper did not do it for the money, because obviously, he you know he threw away six thousand bucks just to just to make a point, and I do think he left that money there most likely to send us a message. Although it's also possible, it's conceivable that Cooper didn't do it for the money, and he took all that money and buried it in little stashes all over the Pacific Northwest, and only one stash was found. You know, you're doing nothing this weekend. You know, you might consider getting your shovel and going out and start digging some holes. There might be some Cooper money down there. <laughs> <laughs> Just randomly all over the Pacific Northwest. Uh, you know, absolutely. And don't worry about any of this private property stuff. You know, just go start digging some holes. But uh, I think more likely that he just left it at that one spot to uh, to send us a little message. You know, I mean, because let's remember when the money was found. It was about nine years after the hijacking. The general consensus out there was among, especially among the FBI and everything, is that Cooper had died the night of the hijacking and his body was just never found. So maybe Cooper at some point decided, hey, you know what? My little story is kind of falling off the headlines. Let's let's go out there and tweak everybody and uh, revive a little interest. You know, maybe Cooper was having a little fun with us by putting that money there. If you don't think he did the hijacking for the money, mm -hmm. Why do you do it? That is the question. Um, of course, you know, everybody talks about the grudge. You know what the grudge is. He said he had a grudge, right. but it's unspecified. So, and of course, that's the key to solving the mystery. If you know what the grudge is, you can probably find Cooper. Um, but of course, you'll never know what the grudge is until you find Cooper. So it's a bit of a conundrum. But there's a lot of speculation. And of course, uh, there's speculation about, uh, was it William Smith, the uh, railway worker? Yeah, William Smith is the railroad. Yeah, so the railroader. So his grudge was that, and so a lot of all these people focus on gr the grudge. You know, they thought that while well, he was a laid off Boeing worker, um, and the William Smith, the the grudge there as well. He was a railway worker, and the railways were were actually getting sort of beaten the competition by these airlines, and he was angry about that, and so that was his grudge, and he wanted to you know teach the airlines a lesson. Um, and so there's a lot of speculation on what he, what his grievance was, but if he did indeed have a grudge and he had an agenda beyond money, um, which I think is entirely possible. And the fact of the matter is, is that uh, that's really 
just about the only thing we've got to go on. So what are you going to do? You know, you got to figure out what the grudge is and, and do your best speculation and go from there. I, I do find the rail the railroad grudge to be a little weak. The first place I would look, actually, is at uh, who was it that actually paid the ransom. That That would be the first place I would look, which is, of course, the Global Indemnity Company, which was Northwest Airlines Insurance Company. They were the ones who actually had to pay that ransom. So perhaps Cooper had a grievance against those guys. Yeah, I believe they paid 90%. The airline paid 10%. Yep. And so they paid 180000 bucks, And uh, so, you know, that's a possibility right there. There is a, another, you know, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you every little idea that I've had about Cooper because I still have this, you know, idiotic idea that maybe, hey, somehow, some way I'm going to solve this one. <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you everything, but I will tell you this, kind of what my thinking about the whole thing is and how we might consider going about looking into it besides looking at various grudges. Well, it, another thing is that if you believe, as I believe, that Cooper put the money on the beach at the Columbia River in a place where it really it could not possibly have arrived naturally. That's the other thing about where the money was. It's like uh, to get back to that a little bit. Um, like, for example, I was having a little bit of an online Twitter chat discussion with another D.B. Cooper uh, fanatic. As you, you know who I'm talking about. Is it DB no one? Yes. And that's not you, is it? You, yeah. No, it's not. You're not out there under multiple Twitter handles, are you? But uh, No, and I've actually had him on the show. Yeah, no, and he's great. And it, uh, but uh, this is one, one area. He seems to feel that the money could have arrived there by some sort of natural process. And um, But uh, it seems to me that the money was placed in a way that really removed all ambiguity. Number one, he puts it nine miles upstream from the Lewis River, where the Lewis River dumps into the Columbia River. Everybody, of course, believed that he had somehow parachuted in somewhere into the Lewis River watershed. And so if he did wind up, and of course, people actually searched, there's there's a couple of dams and reservoirs up there, and there were some people actually searched the reservoirs to see if they could find him or his parachute or something, and nothing, of course, was ever found. Even with a submarine. Yep, even with a submarine. Um so if he went down, as, as everybody believed, if he went down to the Lewis River watershed, well, it's conceivable that the money could have somehow washed downstream, although eh, there's that, the, the issue of it getting past a couple of dams, of course, but nonetheless, it could have washed down downstream, and, uh, but then it gets into the Columbia somehow. Well, where is it going to go? It's going to go downstream, I'm guessing. I mean, I don't know much about water, but I think you know things in water tend to go downstream and not upstream. And uh, instead, the, water, the the find is nine miles upstream from where the Lewis River comes into the Columbia. So um, that seems to me that uh, Cooper probably was trying to, you know, send us a very unambiguous message there by putting the money in a place where it could not possibly have naturally arrived. But another point that uh, that this guy made on on Twitter was that. Well, why would he do that? Why would he throw away six thousand dollars when he could have just left several bills there, you know? And and again, I think that if Cooper was indeed sending us a message, he wanted to send us a very, very unambiguous message. And just a few bills, well, that's not an unambiguous message. There's all kinds of ways that just several bills could have arrived on that beach. But when you have three packets of bills that are stacked upon one another and buried a few inches down in the sand, I mean, that seems to me to be pretty unambiguous. If that's the case, to get back to what I was saying about my the way I'm sort of looking at the case right now, and this hasn't actually helped me at all, but if that is the case, if Cooper did actually leave us a clue, a very unambiguous clue on that beach, then that might be, maybe we should re-examine the clues that he left on the plane, the things that he said to Tina Mucklow, and ask ourselves, did he perhaps drop some clues when he was doing the hijacking? Is that a possibility? He left as he very famously left his tie behind, a black tie that said pennies on the back because he bought it at pennies or somebody bought it at pennies. So was that just a random thing? He left the tie there or did he leave it there for a reason? 
He left behind eight cigarette butts, Raleigh's, uh, which, of course, the FBI lost. And, of course, if you want to start getting into conspiracy theories, well, that's a good start, right? Um, well, I've even seen a document that says to throw the cigarette butts away. Yeah. <laughs> Well, according to Larry Carr, he said that uh, he he said that they were. Um, what's the word he said? He said apparently Las Vegas office FBI sent them to Quantico for analysis, and then Quantico supposedly sent them back to to Vegas. But Larry Carr and but Vegas says no. Quantico shipped them to Seattle, and uh, Larry Carr says no. They never got to Seattle. So I mean, it's all confusing. I mean. It's kind of scary when you think about the FBI has such a fabulous reputation for thoroughness and efficiency. And, of course, everybody screws up. But it's a shame those cigarette butts are gone because there'd be some really fantastic DNA evidence on those things, that, you know, if they were still around. So he leaves us. What else? He leaves us. And, and it's interesting to me, too, that he left the butts behind because he, uh, and again, maybe just sheer carelessness, but he was very, very careful to not leave other evidence behind. When he used the, the, the restroom, for example, the, they found no fingerprints on the door or the door handle or inside the restroom. So he was, he was obviously very careful not to leave fingerprint evidence. He got his note back, so they didn't have any paper to analyze. They didn't have um, any handwriting or anything like that to, to analyze. So he's very thorough about all that stuff, and yet he leaves eight cigarette butts behind. And his tie. And his tie. Um and uh, some other bits of evidence that I don't want to get into quite. But uh, if you take a look at everything he left behind, and you know, and again, I have not been able to make any sense of it. Okay, so but um, for example, the cigarette butts, uh, eight cigarette butts, Raleigh's. Did he want us to believe that he smoked Raleigh cigarettes when maybe he was actually a Marlboro man, or maybe he wasn't a smoker at all, and maybe he just wanted people to think that he was, um, and. But the fact that he left the butts behind is, a, you know, again, again, this, this is not me saying absolutely positively anything, but it makes me wonder if perhaps uh, uh, the word Raleigh or the name Raleigh has some significance. Again, probably not. Doubtful. But it's worth keeping in the back of your mind. Uh, because and that's the other thing, too, about, about the Raleigh cigarette butt issue. It's like, recall that he... Um, Asked Tina Mucklow if she wanted to, if she wanted a cigarette, and he held the pack out to her. You know, it's almost it's almost as if he's going like, "Hey, you know, hey, look at this! It's a pack of Raleigh cigarettes." And, but again, I don't know. This is all just spitballing on my part, and uh, it's and because when you get into Cooper, as you know, at a certain point you get kind of desperate and you're willing to try anything. You know, you know what I'm saying. Yes, I do know what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> anything, anything, anything. Uh, there ain't much to go on here. But uh, yeah, I do. I do wish that some of your, uh, you know, at least one of your listeners out there, if somebody has access to Global Indemnity Co- Company's database and all their records. You know, you might look go go take a look back there and see if you can find a claim for maybe say two hundred thousand bucks that they turned down that they refused to pay on. No, that's that's a possibility. Um, that's know, an interesting idea. I don't know if the FBI ever looked into those guys or not. I know they spent vast amounts of time looking into the whole Raleigh cigarette angle. They wasted tons of time on that. Um, so, you know, you would hope that they would look into the possibility that this guy was angry at the insurance company. <laughs> I mean, you know, really, I would consider that. And there's some other possible... Uh, grudges out there that I can think of. I'm not going to get into those. There's so there's just too many grudges to list really. But, um, and you never know too. And Cooper might've actually lied. Maybe he was just doing it as a lark. When he said that whole grudge thing, he was just, you know, it was just entirely a red herring. I mean, personally, I think he had some sort of, some sort of a reason and call it a grudge for doing this beyond just, you know, doing it for the sheer fun of it. I do, but that's not a guaranteed thing. Maybe he did just do it for the sheer bleeding hell of it. And you don't think money was a motivating factor? Um, I suspect not, because I again, I think that he probably would have asked for more money if it had been all about the money. It seems to me like two hundred thousand bucks is um, really kind of the bare minimum to achieve some credibility. Let's say you're doing something and doing this airline hijacking, and you are doing it uh, for reasons other than the money. So, how much do you ask for? 
Well, you could ask for 50,000 bucks. And that would definitely, that would definitely smooth the path. It's a lot easier to climb on and come up with 50 grand in a hurry. But of course, nobody's going to believe that you're going to blow yourself up for 50,000 bucks. So maybe a hundred is still, mm, it seems to me like 200,000 bucks is kind of for 1971, kind of the minimum, the minimum amount that people would credibly believe that you might blow yourself up over this whole thing. But, you know, so, so that's a possibility. Uh, he asked for 200,000 uh, bucks because that was just, mm, the, that was just, he wanted to keep the number as low as possible, but it had to be at a certain level to convince people he meant business. And so that's one of the reasons I've, I've sort of wondered about um, whether he did it for the money or not, of course. And of course, there's the, he, he, he apparently threw away 6,000 bucks by burying it in the sand at, um, at Tina Bar. So, you know, I, I think on balance, I don't believe he did it for the money, uh, but I could be wrong. It could be that he actually did manage to launder the money somewhere and someplace and then none of it ever turned up, but he actually did spend the money. We won't know until we track him down. I'm uh, still hopeful that we'll do that because I'm just imagining the book deal I'm going to get if I do that and the movie deal. Oh, it's going to be great. And uh, you know, <laughs> So you're going to solve it yourself. Oh, absolutely. And, and when the movie is made, Tom Hanks is going to play not just me. He's also going to play D.B. Cooper. And probably I like it. Multiple probably, roles. They'll probably play the pilot as well. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah, I would, yeah. I think it's going to be Tom Hanks all the way. He might just he might just go and drag and play Tina Mucklow. I don't know, but uh, <laughs> maybe we'll get Brad Pitt to play Tina. Uh, but uh, uh, anyway, but uh, who knows? It's, it's it's great. I don't. I I try not to spend too much time on Cooper. And even though I've been, I probably, I started looking into the mystery probably eh, five, six years ago when I really started looking into it in earnest. I still haven't devoted a huge amount of my life to it. I refuse to let Cooper run my life. I just won't do it because there's just, there's too many people out there that have driven themselves crazy with this Cooper thing. You don't want to get sucked all the way into the vortex? Not quite. Not quite. Yeah. I do remember when I was uh, just starting to look into it, I, uh, they called up Bruce Smith. I don't have you chatted with Bruce at all? Oh, many times. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he's a great guy. Very very friendly and very helpful. And uh, and uh, and he, he asked me what I was doing, why I was looking into this stuff, and and uh, and I said, well, I do this podcast, and so I just started looking into it, and I find it's really really kind of fascinating. And and he just laughed and says, "Welcome to the world of Cooper," and it's really true. It's uh, we're in Cooperland, and. Uh, there's, it's just a whole little world in and of itself. It'd be worthy of a documentary, really. And, and sort of, you know, Jeffrey Gray's book, in a sense, is kind of like that. His book is really almost, it's really more about the people who are looking for Cooper than it is about Cooper himself. I agree. And that's kind of what I've tried to do with my show as well. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just about who is D.B. Cooper, but the people who are trying to solve the case. Yeah. You know, I still have my, I, I, even though I'm not looking into it too much, I still have my antenna out a little bit. I'm probably giving away too much when I talk, when I say this, but um, I just happened to randomly stumble across a story several months back. This is why you just, you know, you have to keep all that stuff in the back of your mind. You know, the, uh, you know, the eight Raleigh cigarette butts, $200,000 and stuff like that. You just sort of keep it in the back of your mind. And when you come across something, it's like, oh. Make a note of that. And one of the things I noticed, I, a story I ran across. Have you ever heard of the kidnapping of George Weyerhaeuser? Uh, v vaguely. Yeah, he was, of course, near from Woodland. So, you know, he's from kind of the area, not too far away from there. But he uh, he was, he eventually became the head of Weyerhaeuser Lumber Company. Uh, they were a big, very wealthy family. He was uh, he was kidnapped way back when, like in the 1920s, uh, at, at about the age of nine, held for ransom. For about a week, the ransom demand was two hundred thousand dollars, and turns out the family lived in Tacoma. You'll recall Cooper's famous statement to Tina: "It looks like Tacoma." That's the, that's the one thing that I, that's the one thing that. Is, and again, this is this doesn't necessarily mean anything. I have not yet yet been able to suss out any connection between the Weyerhaeuser kidnapping and uh, and DB Cooper. I don't think there actually is one. 
but it's one of those things you see that and you see these and you see these possible connections and so of course your your ears go sort of perk up and you go like hmm and you look into it and i again looked into the, the warehouse or kidnapping and so far i can't find any connection any possible connection to uh, to cooper but the two hundred thousand dollar ransom demand which by the way for that time was staggeringly high two hundred thousand bucks i mean the Lindbergh kid kidnapping happened around the same time, and they only wanted fifty thousand bucks. So two hundred thousand bucks for little George Warehouser was a really princely sum for that time. Uh, but the, one of the things about about Cooper's uh, statement to Tina about Tacoma, so he looks out the window and says, turns to her and says, "Looks like Tacoma." I'd never gotten around to checking this. This is this is why again I got I, I'm going at a lackadaisical pace on this. I'd never gotten around to checking the weather in Tacoma to find out. Of course, there's a storm rolling in from the north that day, and a lot of cloud cover. And one of the one of the questions I have, and I don't know if there's enough records to be able to confirm it one way or the other. I, I, one of the questions I've had is what exactly was the amount of cloud cover over Tacoma that day. And so, in other words. Did Cooper really look out the window and see what looked like Tacoma down below? Would he even have been able to? And this gets back to what I was saying about did Cooper drop any little nuggets, any little clues for us during the hijacking itself? If Cooper looked out the window and was able to see nothing but clouds, and yet still he turns to Tina and says, hey, looks like Tacoma. Well, maybe that means something. But again, spitballing, you know. Desperation. Uh, I, I'll have to. I don't know that there's any way to really find out one way or another the extent of the cloud cover over Tacoma that day. And probably he really did just look out the window and see what appeared to be the outline of Tacoma on the ground. I don't know if I ever do somehow manage to find out what the weather was like that day. And if Tacoma, if Tacoma was completely socked in under low lying clouds everywhere. Um, hmm. We have to we have to ask ourselves what is the significance of what he said. Yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, again, uh, it's out there. It's it's out there. I don't want people to listen to this and come away thinking that I'm a complete flaming moon bat. I'm just I'm approaching the whole thing with the point of view that every every one of these things, from what he said about Tacoma to the cigarette butts, uh, yada yada yada, may have significance. That doesn't mean I, have, you know, 100% believe any of this stuff actually does have significance. I just think we have to kind of treat it that way. You know, you can't just dismiss this stuff. I mean, it might actually mean something, but it probably does not. That's, and I have to say that I don't want people thinking I'm a complete flipping moon bat here. Just a partial moon bat. <laughs> exactly. No, that's just all. <laughs> that's just all stuff not to obsess over. You know, like the, you know, it's just stuff to keep in the back of your mind, and so. You never know. One of these days, you'll find out, you know, you have all this stuff just sort of hanging out back there in the back of your head. And then and, and you come across that one little thing that makes everything fall in place. Probably not going to happen. So, like I said, you're probably you know, just as likely to win the lottery. But, uh, you know, if you're if you're really into the Cooper thing, like I said, just familiarize yourself with all that stuff and keep it in your head. And uh, you never know. Maybe someday the scales will fall from your eyes and it'll become quite apparent that Tom Hanks was actually D.B. Cooper. That would be interesting. That would be awesome, I think. How old was Tom Hanks when Cooper did that? It would have been about, what, 10, 15 years old? That sounds about right. Yeah. So, hey, there you go. <laughs> yeah. And luckily, I'm way too young to be D.B. Cooper, but I'm sure you are too. Yeah, I wasn't even born when D.B. Cooper pulled this off. You know, actually, my dad... Would have been about the right age, but my dad was, uh, he was bald. So, and I'm pretty sure the stewardesses would have spotted a toupee. Um, so I'm pretty sure it was not my dad. Beyond that, I don't know. Uh, what do you think it says about what kind of person he was? Just the fact that he's able to be calm, cool, and collected. The stewardesses reported that he was polite. Yeah. He ordered meals for the crew. Yeah. I mean, what does that say about him and who he was? Yeah, well, that's, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the there have been people out there, of course, who speculated that perhaps he was a professional. And he uh, he obviously seemed to know how to use a parachute. And so I don't uh, I don't have I don't believe at all any of the speculation that he knew nothing about or very little about skydiving and parachutes. I think he knew a lot about it. 
the evidence indicates it really. And, uh, and he was calm under pressure. Uh, you know, there's that possibility that he was some sort of special ops kind of guy. I think that, uh, I've had these thoughts and I know that, uh, I know that gray and skyjack sort of touches on this a little bit that perhaps, um, it was some sort of special ops thing to uh, goose the airlines into beefing up their security because there's hijackings going on left and right. And yet the airliners, or excuse me, the airlines were uh, fairly influential uh, campaign contributors, et cetera. So people in Washington didn't really want to start coming down on them and forcing them to do stuff. So what about just doing a little sort of special ops thing? And uh, this guy shows up with a bomb on an airplane, and you know, maybe this will finally be the wake-up call for the airlines to you know, really start taking security seriously. And so support for this, which is, by the way, extremely negligible, but uh, there is a fact that he was really fairly professional in the way he went about the whole thing. So that, it, you know, and, and also the name that he gave, Dan Cooper, well, Dan Cooper's initials were DC. So there you go. So do you think it was um, a professional, a special forces? Uh, like a, a, a Washington, you know, sent by the government, our government and all that stuff. Uh, I kind of doubt it, but you know, it's, it's entirely possible, but I kind of doubt it. You think it was more likely a civilian? It could have been, uh, it could possibly have been a civilian, uh, basically on kind of the same mission. There's certainly, especially that generation, there were plenty of there are plenty of people around uh, who had who would have had all kinds of combat experience in uh, going back as far as World War II, and combat experience in jumping out of planes, etc. There was World War II, and then there was Korea, and then Vietnam, of course. And so, plenty of uh, there's plenty of guys out there who probably would have been in far far dicier situations, um, you know. And so, this was not that huge of a deal to them, and um, who had knowledge of, you know, of how to put on a share of a parachute and jump out of a plane at night because they'd done it and maybe in battle. So, um, you know, it's entirely possible some private actor out there decided for maybe he saw all these headlines in the papers about all these skyjackings that have been taking place and thought, you know, I'm going to go out there and I'm going to go out there and, and do it myself. And maybe this will finally get those damn airlines to straighten up and clean up their act. So that's that's entirely a plausible scenario right there. Yeah, most people at the time, most no, not most people, I should say, most men uh, would have served in the military. Oh yeah, a really high percentage in 1971. Oh yeah, uh, dudes in their 40s. Oh uh-huh. yeah, lots of guys, lots of guys at that age. Again, a, a reasonable number of them would have been paratroopers, and so you know, it's an, and but and again, there were people out there special ops types uh, who had served like in Vietnam and uh, over places like uh, Cambodia and Laos with 727s, of course, pushing secret cargoes and commandos out the back of 727s, just the same way Cooper went. Uh, There was plenty of that. Um, And of course, a lot of, uh, I don't know, I don't know if this was the case by that time, but, but the 727 did actually become kind of a, a favorite for mass skydiving stunts and stuff like that. I don't know if you've seen any of those videos on the web of, you know, masses of skydivers all running, jumping out the back of 727s. I have. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good, good plane for that since it'll hold a ton of people. It'll hold a lot of people and the air stairs are just a a great little exit. You know, you don't need to, I mean, I would, I personally, I'd never actually jumped out of a plane myself. I wouldn't mind trying it sometime actually because that was fun, but, uh, I haven't gotten around to it, but if I were going to jump out of a plane, I would much rather jump out of the, the back of the plane rather than jump out the side of the plane where you can sort of like smack into the tail wing or something like that. I, I kind of like the idea of going straight out the back where there's nothing possible that you could smack into or hit. No, you know, no jet engines to get sucked into. But Although a 727 does go quite a bit faster than the planes that most people would be jumping out of. Uh, yeah, it does, you know, and I don't know. I, I'm not sure... I can't remember if I looked up back when I was initially researching this. Obviously, I a lot of my heaviest research took place several years ago, and so I still got my notes and everything. But I didn't review it for before I came on here, and I can't remember if I if I looked up what the stall speed 
for a 727 is. But uh, I would imagine that they were not flying too far above stall speed when, because that's why Cooper wanted to go slow, of course, is bailing out the back of that plane at, say, 500 miles an hour. Well, that would be mm, kind of deadly. Yeah, 500 miles an hour would be rough. Yeah, even 200 miles an hour, frankly, would be a little rough. But, uh, you know, it's possible. People obviously have done it. I mean, a lot of skydivers have jumped out of 727s. Yeah, and I heard a podcast a while back. I'll have to put it in the show notes because I don't remember it right now. But a dude who had jumped out of another plane, and it was going, I want to say, like 370 miles an hour when he jumped out. Mm -hmm. And he said it was like when the wind first hit him, it was like hitting a brick wall. Ah, And then he just tumbled and it took him a while to regain control. Uh Yeah. And so I have no idea what it'd be like, especially, you know, on a cold night like that, you know, jumping outside. Uh, Of course, uh, the cabin was uh, the cabin was probably already rather cool since uh, I don't know if they had the heat on the cabin or not, but. Between the wind and the temperature drop, I'm sure it was would be a bit of a shock. Probably would take the breath right, right out of you. But nonetheless, it's still obviously doable. But had I been Cooper, I still would have chosen to bail out a little further south, which is why I think he probably did. You know, I think Cooper was a sensible, smart guy. Do you think the flight path is accurate? Uh, it seems to be. It seems to be fairly on. I know that there was some speculation that they were way far off to the east, and that's why that's where the whole Washuga washdown theory was born. I uh, I don't know that they were that far off. Well, now there's like a whole Western flight path theory also, where they're speculating the plane was actually west of the theorized flight path. Uh huh. But you know, I mean, what I what I notice about all these things is that, and it's entirely possible, of course, but. Um, a lot of the um, these theories are born sort of from the idea of the you know, from the money find. So it's like people are all like, "Oh, well, we found this money on the banks of the river. It couldn't have gotten there possibly, unless maybe it was off course." And of course, that's that's a good reason to go back and actually check that the plane actually was on the course that everybody thought it was. But, you know, it's uh, a lot of people, it seems to me, have really worked to convince themselves that the plane was way off course one way or the other, just so that they can they can make that conform to their idea that the money must have somehow gotten there just accidentally rather than being put there by somebody. Uh, That's a really good point. Yeah. And so so I'm, I'm open to any 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 sort of talk about that stuff and any new evidence and everything like that. But it seems to me that most of the people who put that stuff forward are just really just trying to justify their theory for how the money floated there and wound up floating up onto the beach. That uh, you know, I'm still I'm still thinking that they were probably more or less on um, on course. But again, you know, radar obviously technology, radar and everything else back in those days was uh, not as sophisticated as it is today. Uh, I'm sure they were at least a little bit off course one way or the other. But you believe he survived the jump? Yeah, I, I don't see any other possibility. Um, and I'm sort of, I'm, I'm really putting a lot on the money find here. Of course, I recognize that. Um, but uh, given that I, I don't see how the money could possibly have gotten onto the beach unless somebody put it there, then that indicates to me that he must have survived. Because if he didn't survive... And let's say he didn't survive and somebody just happens to go out into the woods and stumbles across his rotting corpse and this bag full of money. Um, why would any, why would that person take 6,000 bucks and braid on the sand on the beach? Why? That, that makes utterly no sense. It makes far more sense that D.B. Cooper would put the money there because he wanted to tweak us. And I can't think of any conceivable reason why somebody would find that money and bury it on that beach. That just, there's, I don't know. Can you think of a good reason why somebody might do that? I cannot. Yeah. The money find to me is just baffling. Yeah. I guess actually I can think of one possibility. And of course this is extremely remote and it's just actually fun on my part, but okay. You're the guy that's found DB Cooper's rotting corpse and the bag of money. But your problem is, is that you are a serial killer. And you, the reason you found his rotting corpse is because you were out in the woods getting rid of a corpse yourself. Well, okay. 
Now you can't exactly go get the FBI and lead them to the spot where you found D.B. Cooper, can you? Because that's where all your other bodies are buried. So you got to kind of keep it on the, on the, on the DL, right? So maybe a serial killer found D.B. Cooper's rotting corpse in the bag of money, but had to keep quiet about it because of, of his activities. Um, and do I actually believe that? Absolutely not. But it's a fun theory. <laughs> I mean, imagine that, like D.B. Cooper meets the Green River Killer. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> well there is db cooper versus bigfoot uh there is that but nobody has ever actually tried to bring db cooper and the green river killer you know together in, in the same story maybe we should try that somebody needs to write a screenplay i've seen some loose connections to db cooper and the unabomber but it was that they were the same person yeah i don't really see that you know and of course there's a lot of people out there that are trying to like you know are always trying to connect up these most famous of cases like uh, what's his name steve hodell who wrote a book accusing his father of being the black dahlia killer later on wrote a book also accusing his father of being the zodiac killer and uh, he also believes his father was uh, committed the manila jigsaw murders and et cetera, et cetera. there is this kind of tendency to want to connect up the very most famous most notorious crimes i'll connect them all up together which is yeah, uh, I've you know. I've done three on my show. One was uh, Frank Morris, who escaped from Alcatraz, uh-huh. was DB Cooper and the Zodiac Killer. Yeah, and then I covered Ed Edwards, uh-huh. um, who basically committed every unsolved murder you could think of. Yeah, I uh, uh, Teresa Hallback, John Benet Ramsey, Atlanta Child Killer, yeah. Zodiac, and was D.B. Cooper. Yeah, and, uh, Ed Edwards is also, we covered uh, this, uh, an episode on the murder of Martha Moxley in, in Greenwich, Massachusetts, or Greenwich, Connecticut, excuse me, uh, back in 1975. And there's actually some people who put forward the theory that uh, Ed Edwards was involved in that one. So that's just, I don't, and, and there's another one, which I'm not going to tell you about. It was a, a Portland, a, a murder that happened. It was a double murder that happened in Portland back in like the early 1960s. And uh, it turns out that Ed Edwards was living in Portland at that time. And so he has been, he has, there's some people have speculated that he might have actually been the killer even though some other people were actually convicted and sent to prison for the killings. Uh, the, the, the case against them was not strong at all. But uh, so in that case, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to think that it's possible Ed Edwards did do it. But for the most part, when you look at when, pe- when people bring up Ed Edwards' name in connection with something or another, the, it's, it's almost kind of laughable. You know, uh, this, you know, people want to work Ed Edwards into everything. Yeah, I think there is a lot of evidence that Ed Edwards was kind of a a lover's lane type killer. And there are a lot of crimes that certainly match that M.O. But to link him to everything else is is quite a leap. Yeah, it kind of is. And by the way, this this Portland murder that I've been talking about was indeed a lover's lane murder. Um, Right. It was in the book on Ed Edwards that I read by John Cameron. Oh, was it? Okay, I've not read that book. Uh, There was a book... uh, and uh, it was written by uh, Phil Stanford. Do you remember him? He used to write for the Oregonian, wrote a column for the Oregonian for years. I can actually picture the cover of that book. Yeah, um, yeah it was the Peyton Allen murders. Um, Peyton Allen, that's what it was. Yeah, they were uh, they were parked out in sort of way out Forest Park, kind of near where the Oregon Zoo is today, not too like, not too far from the zoo, on a, on a little dirt road. And... Uh, and uh, so he was found, like, uh, he was found stabbed to death, many, many, stabbed many times, the guy was. And uh, apparently he had had a thirty two automatic with him, and he'd gotten off a shot or two, but uh, to no avail. And his girlfriend was gone, and her body turned up a few weeks later out on Highway 26 in, in, towards the coast. You know, pretty, pretty heinous, scary, frightening crime. This is, you know, Texarkana, Moonlight Murders kind of stuff, right? And uh, so naturally, somebody had to somebody had to pay, and so some people were eventually brought into the dock and, and convicted and sent away for it. But uh, they probably, almost certainly, really didn't do it. So I'm I'm voting. Yeah, I'm kind of I'm willing to think it was Ed Edwards. 
but yeah, uh, hijacking a plane though that is not necessarily eh, it's not really his mo. No, I don't. I don't think so either. Yeah. What about what about Howard Hunt? Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I know Howard Hunt was involved in some strange uh, arms shipments kind of dealios. Uh, I'd never seen anything that remotely convinced me that he had anything to do with it. But you know, hey, you know, any any theories that come out are just good fun. You know, one way or the other. Uh, you know, if they're if they're good, then that's great. And if they're if they're really pathetic, then we can have fun making fun of them, right? So it's all good. But there are any suspects where you think uh, it deserves more of your attention? Uh, let me think. Um, there's nobody really out there that that in my mind is that strong of um, that strong of a suspect. What about Wolfgang Gossett? Yeah, he's he's actually one of the stronger ones. I, I think actually I like him a little better than, than say, Richard McCoy. But I still have not seen anything that really seals the deal for me on Gossett. So, and then uh, there's some of the other ones that like Kenny Christensen uh, is, uh, I'd never, never believed for a moment that it was him. Uh, and then there's uh, Barb, what's her face? Um, Barb Dayton. Barb Dayton. Yeah, another one that I've never found. Uh, any real any real reason to believe that this person was db cooper uh, and in fact the, uh, the in fact all the statements that have been made by this couple who knew her lead me to believe that uh, that that barb was definitely not db cooper because after all i mean barb at some point you know would have probably wanted to share with him the details of how she managed to bail out of the plane and not leave a second pressure bump was, you know that would have been that would have been kind of a neat little achievement, right? Yeah, and she did say that she landed near Aurora. Yeah, yeah, and then hid the money in a cistern on some some farm or some orchard. I think it was. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and again, well, I got I got I got to tell you this about farmers and their and their cisterns. You know, they actually do actually look in their cisterns every once in a while, and so you know the whole idea that maybe maybe she hid it and went back for it. Um, but if she just hit it and then just never went back for it, well, sorry, somebody would have found the money. And that's another thing about the story that's kind of vague. It's like, well, she hid the money. Did she ever go back for it? Uh, we never hear an answer about that. Now, if you were, if you knew her and she was telling you this story, wouldn't that be one of the very, very first questions you would ask her? <laughs> if, didn't you, yes, it didn't would. You go back and get the money. Wouldn't you demand an answer to that question? I sure would. And yet these people seem remarkably incurious about some of these things. Um, and they, they never pressed Barb for any answers on these, on these questions. You know, like, how did you bail out of the plane without leaving another pressure bump? And that seemed to be a lot of curiosity there. So I, I'd never taken Barb seriously as a suspect. Um, and, of course, oh, what are some of the other ones? Uh, Marla, Marla Cooper and her uncle. Her uncle um, that was another one that kind of came and went quickly. LD. LD Cooper, yeah. What about Robert Rackstraw? Uh, too young, I think. I mean, I, well, he would have been like, what, 27? when the? Yeah, I want to say 28 or, 28 or 29. I think McCoy was 26. Yeah, uh, uh, too young. I mean, he was like, uh, Cooper was reported to be, what, in his mid to late 40s? Yes, yeah. and Tina sat next to him for five hours and lit his cigarettes. Yeah. She should... She should know if he, Cooper is the same age as her yeah. or 20 years older. Yeah, you would think. And, and typically, and don't send me angry emails, people, but uh, women tend to be better at noticing a lot of stuff like that. than Absolutely. Are. You know, I mean, things like like if he'd been wearing, say, a toupee or if he had dyed his hair. Things or like was that. wearing makeup. Or was wearing makeup. Uh, I'm, I'm very, very sure Tina would have noticed that. And Flo also. <laughs> and so... When people say, oh, we wore a toupee. No, I don't believe that for a second. Uh, and by the way, toupee technology in 1971 was not nearly as advanced as it is today. And uh, so, and I don't even know, do people wear toupees anymore? I don't know anyone that wears a toupee. Yeah, they were kind of a thing there for a while, but uh, yeah, I don't know anybody that wears one either. Well, anyway, um, uh, so yeah, I, I don't believe that Rackstraw could possibly have been Cooper given his age. He certainly angrily denied the whole thing. Um, 
I don't know. If, if, if I truly was Cooper and this many years had gone by, I'd be more inclined to seek out a you know, lawyer up and seek out a publisher and do a movie deal and whatever. And even though technically he could still be arrested for the crime, would, is there a jury out there that would actually want to send D.B. Cooper to prison for something that happened almost 50 years ago? Right, ninety-three-year-old DB Cooper. Yeah, is there, is there is it truly the case that people would, would get behind that? I don't think so. I don't want to see Cooper go to prison. I, mean, I know he committed a crime, but I don't want to see him go to prison. You know, I think Rackstraw, had he been Cooper, could have profited from the whole thing by admitting to it. He didn't do that. Why do you think so many people have confessed? Well, you know, a lot of people confess to all kinds of crimes. You know. Yeah, and I don't know, you know, what precisely motivates people to do that kind of thing. Maybe it's a desire for attention, you know, a little bit of mental illness. It, it makes utterly no sense to me to confess to a crime he didn't commit. But you know, maybe I'm maybe I'm not normal. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it it's it's just uh, it's such a common thing. I mean, I, that people do confess to stuff that they didn't do. It's just uh, I think that's all it is. It's just people looking for attention. But some of the voluntary deathbed confessions in this, Mm -hmm. where I'm just like, why would you do that? Why would you spend your last hour to lie about something? Mm -hmm. I know. That's true. Is it some sort of wanting glory after you're gone? Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. You know, it's a good question. Uh, You know, I'm not an expert on human nature or anything like that, you know, but it's, it's entirely possible that if you spend your entire life being a pathological liar. It's entirely possible that you will just continue with that pattern right up until the moment you die. In fact, you might actually be thinking, I got to cook up one final incredibly cool lie before I take my last breath. (laughs) You're right. From the standpoint of a normal human being, the deathbed words, you know, I wouldn't, you know, necessarily want to do that, but I don't, you know, I don't necessarily think like a sociopathic liar, you know, yeah, because I was talking to Greg Gossett, and he was telling me about you know, his dad, Wolfgang, uh-huh. and his brother went to visit him when he was dying in the hospital, and his brother told him that when he went to visit his their dad, the first thing he did was tell him about D.B. Cooper and how he was D.B. Cooper, uh-huh. and he hadn't seen him in like 10 years. Uh-huh. So why... Yeah. You know, you haven't seen your son in 10 years, and the first thing you're going to do is talk about that. Yeah, that's true. But uh, by the way, do you know, I, I totally do not know this. I'm ashamed just to admit this, but did the FBI ever get any DNA from Gossett and check him against what they have from the tie? I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, Wolfgang, it, he's really interesting, but he's also difficult to get information on. Uh, there's another Cooper researcher who I won't name, but did a lot of work on it, but hasn't released any of that yet. Um, and oh. I've heard that he doesn't have any interest in coming on the show because he still plans to release is that Galen, some of his uh, work on that. Are you talking about Galen Cook? Uh, yes, I am. <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, yeah. Galen, yeah, Galen, is, Galen claims to be sitting on top of a lot of information. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm dying to see it too. Um, I'm not. I'm not doubting him at all but i really wish he would just for christ's sakes you know write your book or something and let's see what you got dude i mean really come on we want to see it you know we're dying for we're dying for anything here we know we're desperate right yeah yeah we're desperate well joe what do you think it would take to solve the db cooper case um um a bit of luck and uh, a lot of manpower. I think that there's there's actually, the, yeah, the FBI has added, they've got the, of course, you've seen the stuff they've got out in the vault. And you've been to the vault, right? On their website? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, they've got quite a bit of, um, quite a bit of stuff out there. It seems to me they've added quite a bit of stuff recently. Have you noticed that? There's more stuff out there than there used to be. I think after they closed the case, they, they scanned and added quite a few files to it. Yeah, and the latest release, I want to say, was two weeks ago. Yeah, and so there's like, what, 46, 46 basically tranches of files out there now. And I think, you know, originally when I started looking into this whole thing, there were only like seven or nine out there. So there, it's grown quite a bit. And uh, I'm sure you've looked at some of it. It's frustrating because it's so heavily redacted. 
and some. Oh yeah, some of the documents you don't even know what you're reading. Yeah, uh, you can't tell. I mean, it's like they've they've redacted every other word except like and or or. It seems like you know, it's just like oh, you know, it's like it's. I think the only way to do it without totally losing your sanity is to, is for maybe some some guys like us should organize an effort to get. Uh, there's 46 files out there right now that I know of. And uh, what we could do is organize an effort where each volunteer goes through one file and just very carefully, you know, makes notations about what's in there. And, you know, just like the, so this file, for example, covers uh, FBI reports on somebody who was reported to be a possible suspect and they investigated this suspect, you know, something like, you know, something like that. So that way we could all have an idea of what's in all these files and, and we're not all duplicating efforts by going out there and all of us trying to read those files, which is you know, a big undertaking and incredibly frustrating. As again, as I'm sure you're aware, but you know, somewhere in the middle of all that stuff, there might be a nugget of something really, truly useful. It's just that I personally, again, I'm not obsessed enough about DB Cooper to actually take the time to go through all that stuff in the, in the, the vague hope there might be something useful in there, but a group effort, uh, you know, maybe. Yeah. I, I mean, I know a lot of people who are going through it. Yeah. Um, and, and hopefully they're, they're doing what I'm talking about and sort of divvying up the files. So they're not duplicating their efforts and that would be nice. Um, that would be nice, but I don't know how much uh, cooperation is going on with that right now. I know exactly. That's the whole thing. Is you know, if you do find that juicy little nugget of evidentiary goodness, are you going to share it with the other Cooperologists? Well, probably not, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, of course not. But that was that seems to me like some sort of cooperative effort would be helpful. Um, but probably, like you say, it's human nature being what it is, and I'm the same way. If I come across some really juicy little thing, I'm not going to share it with the world. Um, I'm going to see where it goes first. Um, another thing is, I, I, again, there are some uh, there are some investigatory possibilities I would love to look into, but I don't really have the resources. And I'd like to, if I could somehow get the FBI back on the case, you know, I'd like the FBI to check out the insurance company angle. That's something that I don't have the resources uh, to look into that. I mean, I could certainly look through the files, but there's no way I can compel this insurance company to share its files with me there. And so there's certain avenues of investigation like that, that definitely, well, if I had the manpower and the, and the resources to do it, I could possibly, maybe, yeah, maybe, but I just don't have it. I just don't have the, the resources to do that. Let's, let's, let's also not neglect the possibility that Cooper may still be alive and, uh, Someday, very, very soon, he's going to pass, and then we're all going to find out the truth. That's true. You know, and he's been saving that, that stack of 20s and his plane ticket and the parachute in his attic. Uh-huh. I, uh, <clears throat> and actually, I think for a lot of a lot of us out here in Cooperland, I think that's going to be kind of a, a bittersweet day when that happens, if it happens. And, you know, we find out who he is, yay, but it's like, uh, it's like, well, the whole thing's done. <laughs> it's all over. There, there. We're gonna have to find something else to obsess about from now on. I mean, we'll, as, yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. I've thought about that a lot. Like when the case is solved, I know how how is that gonna feel for everyone? I know. That's, who's that's, gonna be happy about it? Who's gonna be upset? Yeah. Who was wrong about everything? Yeah, I think I think there are gonna be some some sort of depressed people out there in Cooperland. I really do. And, uh, and, uh, you know, I'll be a little sad too, you know, I, uh, you know, but, but at the same time, I, I haven't really dedicated my life to Cooper. So I think I'm going to be okay. Uh, but if I were, one of these, <laughs> if I were truly one of these people, that's really, really devoted like half of my life to this thing. Yeah. I don't know. That could be kind of a shattering experience really. Especially if it turns out that everything you believe about the case and have been saying about the case for decades is complete BS. <laughs> you were totally wrong about everything. Oh, my God. How's that going to make you feel? Yeah, and you've just spent the last 10 years of your life doing it. I know. I know. I mean, who knows? You know, Maybe you're going to drop this episode and I'm going to get a letter in the mail from D.B. Cooper saying, you're such a moron. <laughs> you, got, <laughs> you got everything wrong. 
So, DB, if you're out there, please feel free to call me a moron. Just enclose a $20 bill from the ransom so I know it's you and not some crank. Right, with a small DNA swab. Yeah, I know. Uh, but uh, he, he probably is dead by now. Especially you know, if he really was a heavy smoker, he probably is dead. So we probably don't need to worry about that. But I wouldn't totally discount the possibility that he's still alive and uh, that we'll find out who he was. Yeah, who knows? Maybe the FBI will somehow recover those cigarette butts. Maybe they're sitting in a little baggie in that, you know, that gigantic warehouse and at, at the end of Raiders of the Lost Ark where they, they stashed away the Ark at the end of the movie? Yes. Yeah, somewhere in that warehouse, there's there's like a manila envelope that's got those eight cigarette butts in it, you know, and somebody will stumble across that and it's like, wow, you know, and they'll do a little DNA on it and we'll, and we'll just do some 23 and me action like they've been doing with other criminals and we'll find out who Cooper was. I would say the odds of that happening are, are probably less than the odds of me winning the lottery, but Hey, you never know. <laughs> it could happen. It could happen. Do you plan to cover Cooper at all on your new podcast? The shocking details. You know, I think we might just do that. Well, because we'll, we'll, I know that my pod, my podcast partner Vince Caldoni is uh, he's he's interested in the in the mystery as well. He's got his own thoughts about about DB Cooper, and so we were thinking about maybe at some point we'll just do an episode where we just sort of sort of sit around and chat about our thoughts about the whole thing. We don't try to start from square one and tell everybody every single thing about the you know maybe we do a thirty second summation of the whole thing. You know. Gets on the plane, has a bomb, hijacks the plane, gets some money, they fly south, he disappears off the plane. That would be our summation of it. And then we'll just spend the rest of the time talking, kind of like you and I are talking right now, uh, you know, about our thoughts about the whole thing. So, yeah, I would I would say that uh, there's a very good possibility we'll be talking about it. And, of course, you know, your listeners, by the way, they should turn, they should tune into the, the new podcast anyway, because they probably need a little break from Cooper once in a while. So we have some other stuff besides Cooper for you to listen to. Not that we're suggesting that you abandon Cooper completely. But, you, know, you probably do want a little bit of a, a little bit of a break from it every now and again. By the way, have you listened to any episodes of the new podcast? We've only got three of them out there so far. Yeah, I listened to the Arkansas Ghost Trial. Uh, how'd you like that one? What's your honest opinion? It was really interesting. I loved the whole the victim turns back up. I yeah. had never heard of the case before. It's uh, very obscure. You know, the uh, we got a I got a message on Twitter from one of our listeners who said she lives like about an hour away from where that whole thing happened. And she said she had never heard of it before. This is one of these cases that totally got dropped down the memory hole. And uh, and that's kind of that's kind of the stories that we're, we're kind of hoping to find and, and talk about is some of the stuff that's been completely forgotten um, by everybody and dig these stories. We're trying to dig these stories up and bring them out for people to hear about because it really is amazing. I mean, we spend all of our time obsessing about D.B. Cooper and John JonBenet Ramsey, but there's a lot of other really interesting stories out there that just for some reason or another just don't seem to get any oxygen and they just kind of go away. You know what I mean? And uh, so anyway, that's that's going to be sort of our our niche is to dredge up these old obscure stories and bring them back to the world. So anyway, I, I do hope your listeners are going to listen to our, the podcast is the shocking details on iTunes and Stitcher and everywhere else. And it's uh, me and Vince and, uh, you know, we're going to try to keep the quality high as high as we can. And again, we, we might have some DB Cooper content for you, for your listeners one of these days. And also, Bo, by the way, I wanted to share something else with you and your listeners. Uh, I'm appearing on, all right. On, uh, show on discovery science channel there's a new reality show out there called curse of the bermuda triangle i don't know if you've seen that one yet i saw you post about this on twitter yeah posted something about it on twitter so that is um i don't know when you're actually going to drop your episode here that we're recording here i suppose it's, i assume it's going to be a few weeks so i suppose i had to talk about it really more in the past tense but uh so the episode that I am in is episode five, where we talk about the uh, disappearance of the sh of the boat witchcraft off Miami in 1967. That's uh, that that show aired on March 8th on the Curse of the Bermuda Triangle, and I know it's out there. You can find it. It's like uh, probably on Hulu and God knows where. And if you want to go to say Amazon Prime, you can buy the episode for like a buck ninety nine. So if you're dying to see me on the TV tube, you know then hey. There you go. 
Warning, though, I, I might look a little red. I actually foolishly forgot that I was appearing on a TV show, and I went out and got sunburned, and so I was a little bit reddish when we filmed that thing. So uh, I'm not usually that quite that pink, as you see me in that book. Yeah. <laughs> you got sunburned right before your TV appearance. I huh? know, and I was... And I was uh, I was thinking about that after I got to sunburn. I thought, oh crap, you know, what an idiot! I should have put on more sunblock because you know. And then I thought, oh, you know what? Yeah, they've got makeup people. They'll be able to make me look fine. And we get out there. Now it's kind of a more of a a little bit more of a low budget operation than that it turns out. And they did not have makeup people to to make me look all perfect. So, uh, so I don't know how you know, uh, you know. Well, you can you can tune in and see for yourself. You know. Hopefully, I'm not so scary that people are going to scream and turn, you know, turn their TV off or anything. Um, I'll definitely check it out. Yeah, no, it's uh, it was it was kind of kind of fun. It was uh, they 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 contacted us because we did an episode on this very topic, and so they wanted us to you know consider appearing on the show. And Steve was out of the country, Devin was busy, and so it fell to me to do to go to Miami and be on this uh, on this TV show. So it was kind of fun. It was a it was a lark, you know. We'll see, uh, and hopefully, you know, it won't turn out to be too humiliating for me. And I talked to the producer when he called me last week and said, uh, told me it was going, the episode was going to drop. He said, "And uh, this, this is most likely just Hollywood talk." But he was like, "Yeah, Joe, you were great. You know, if we have a season two, we might have you back on." So you know, who knows? Maybe I'll be on sometime in season two. I hope so. Hopefully, you know, what about now, you know, nobody's really talked about the connection between the the triangle and DB Cooper. So, you know, maybe they need to talk about that. That could be your specialty. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that's the thing about the triangle is the triangle, the triangle is all powerful. It respects no boundaries. And, you know, so really it can reach out to pretty much anywhere and, you know, do what it does. It's like, you know, it's not confined to this time, this one small area. So yeah, that would that might be my thought process and why we should be really, really thinking about the Bermuda Triangle when we talk about D. B. Cooper. And uh, he could still be falling in the Bermuda Triangle right now. Uh, yeah, it's a good point. Poor Cooper. Oh my God, I bet he's getting tired of it. But, uh, yeah. Anyway, that's that's a little out there. I don't think I'm actually going to run that idea past him because I would probably never hear from them again. Uh, this is <laughs> ways to get ghosted by the Hollywood producers. Yeah, <laughs> so I'm not going to probably float that idea actually. But we'll see. I'm not. I don't. I don't even know if there's going to be a season two and uh, whatever. We'll see what happens. But uh, hopefully, if there is a season two and they fly me out there, they'll you know put they'll fly me out to Key West for a week and put me up in a nice hotel. We'll see. I'm not thinking. We'll bring sunscreen next time. Uh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, uh, so that's about what's going on with me, new podcast, TV appearance. But other than that, you know, man, nothing too much. Oh, yeah, and by the way, if you, if you happen to have some frequent flyer miles, you can always come to Portland on March 14th where I'm having a meetup with Generation Y. It's going to be Thinking Sideways and Gen Y are getting together for a meetup. I saw that. Yeah. That looks awesome. Yeah, you should fly on and out. You're, uh, you're not that far away, right? You're you're in Colorado, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you're. Only, that wouldn't be too bad. Yeah. So uh, actually, you can drive that in two days, easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just twenty two hours away. Yeah, exactly. You know, nothing like spending two long, long, excruciatingly long days in the car. Yeah, but <laughs> it can be done. Uh, but anyway, yeah, it's it's still there. If you change your mind and decide you want to fly on up, then you know, you know, definitely, we'd love to see you there. We can all talk about Cooper because I know Jen Y did an episode about Cooper eons ago. By the way, they concluded that he died the night of. Yes, I remember listening to that quite a while back. Yeah, they they concluded that he died. They should have talked to me first, but oh well. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Well, if somebody wants to uh, to find you and ask you what's going on, where's the best place to reach out to you? Uh, of course, there's email. Uh, it's uh, the Shocking Details Podcast at Gmail, and of course, I'm we are on Twitter, uh, Shocking Details uh, on Twitter, and uh, so you can easily find us there. We um, we also have uh, we dropped a few episodes in the old Thinking Sideways podcast feed. So if nothing else, you know, if, there, if you've run out of all options, you've lost all your information, you can always go out to the Thinking Sideways feed, look in there, and then there were several episodes. There were like two episodes in there, plus one little message that I also dropped in there. 
And in those episodes, there's all kinds of contact information in there as well that uh, we are working on other stuff, of course, like, you know, setting up maybe an Instagram and a Patreon, but we haven't gotten around to that yet. And so, again, we're just starting out in this little adventure. So it's a work in progress. Well, thanks for coming on and talking to us about Cooper, Joe. I really appreciate it. Hey, Darren. Thanks a lot for, for listening to my, my endless mm, ludicrous speculations on the whole thing. Again, that's, that's kind of all we have right now. So, you know, don't hold it against me. <laughs> If you have questions or comments for Joe, you can find him on Twitter at Danger Probe, and be sure to check out his new podcast, The Shocking Details. They even have a website too, theshockingdetails.com. Also, if you've never heard Thinking Sideways podcast before, be sure to check it out. It is great. We've got links to it all in the show notes for you. Is there a suspect we haven't covered yet? Or someone you think we should have on the show? Let us know. You can find us on Facebook. We are The Cooper Vortex. Instagram, at The Cooper Vortex. On Twitter, at DB Cooper Podcast. Or email us, dbcooperpodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review. Thank you to Joe Swainey for spending his Saturday morning with me. Thank you to Russell Colbert for spending his nights and weekends producing this show. I'm Darren Schaefer, and thank you for listening to The Cooper Vortex.